Hello and welcome to Alta Live. Um, for those of you who are regulars here at Alta Live, it takes a hot minute for our audience to fill into the Zoom room. So while that happens, it is my great honor to welcome you. I Today we're going to discuss Sir Francis Drake's legacy here in Northern California, particularly in Marin County. I am so excited to welcome our two guests today. It's, um, it's a real thrill to welcome Peter C. Mancall. He is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of the Humanities, a professor of history and anthropology, the Linda and Harlan Martins Director of the USC Huntington Early Modern Studies Institute, and divisional for the humanities at USC Dorn's Life. He has written, he's the author of seven books. He has taught at Oxford. He is an incredible history expert, um, and we are delighted to have him here today. He is also the author of Sir Francis Drake's Date with Destiny. We're gonna link this article in our comments section so you can read it if you haven't already. Um, we're also gonna to chat today with Brian Colbert. Brian was sworn in to the San Anselmo Town Council in 2017 and reelected. I believe he came in first in 2020. He served as mayor from 20, 2020 to 2021 um, and is credited with a number of successful um, new, uh, undertakings in San Anselmo, including a new community park from flood mitigation projects. He's enhanced downtown business traffic. I will note as a parent, San Anselmo is home to the best playground in all of Marin County Memorial Park. Um, and it's it's an honor to have them both here. Brian served has served on the town council as they have dealt with the debate of Drake's name change or removal of Drake's name from both what was formerly Drake High School, as well as what is currently kind of Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. So um, with that, we're going to chat for about 30 minutes. If you have questions for either Peter or Brian, please add them to the Q&A button. You'll note down at the bottom. There's also a chat. I like to ask our audience to get the chat started by letting us know where they're zooming in from today. If you are unfamiliar with Alta Journal, we are an award-winning quarterly focused on California and the West. If you like what we do here today, if you're interested in topics like these, Lawrence, Kansas, San Diego, Santa Rosa, hi everyone. Um, I do hope you'll check us out. We've got a, a quarterly journal, a website, a free California book club, free newsletters. You can see that all on altaonline.com. That's This interview will also be recorded and posted there later today. We're gonna send you an email with a link to this interview, a link to this article, and any other reference materials that pop up over the course of this conversation. Inverness, Oregon. It's so great to see everyone. Thank you so much. Selena Sacramento. I love it. Thank you guys. Um, so to get started, I am here in Novato, California, just north of San Anselmo. Peter, where are you? I'm in Los Angeles. And Brian? I'm going to have to ask you to- I am in San Anselmo. Um, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> with my constituents with yes <laughs> yes as you should be oh little rock arkansas wow very cool um so peter i'm going to ask you to kind of get us started your your article in alta really deals with the history as we know it of sir francis drake as we've kind of promoted this event we've received a number of emails questioning whether or not Sir Francis Drake, a, a noted explorer, perhaps as you mentioned, most famous for being the first person to circle the globe. Um, did he really land in California? Was he really involved? What was his, his level of involvement in the slave trade and his relationship with enslaved and indigenous peoples that he encountered in his journeys? Thanks, Beth, and I'm delighted to be here today, and, and I'm delighted to have this conversation with Brian as well. Okay, so that was a lot of questions. I'm I sure know. I won't get all of them, but I'll try. First, he was the second uh, commander of, of an expedition that went around, uh, but he's the first one, first European commander to actually survive such an expedition. Magellan's ship made it around the world, but not with, but Magellan didn't make it all the way. But that is why, at the time, Drake was incredibly famous, far more important in England that he went around the world than this whatever he did on what is the West Coast of now uh, the United States. Um, so I'm gonna try to answer your questions. I'll try to be brief in answers, but basically, was he involved in the slave trade? Yes, um, he is. He, is, he was a, a child of rather humble means. He is sort of apprenticed out into a family that's involved in, in long distance 
commerce, uh, one of whom, a member of whom, one, one member of that family, John Hawkins, trying to impress the queen, is the first, as far as we know, English person to get involved in uh, slave trade. Um, I should point out, just to be sure we know what we're talking about, when Hawkins is doing that and then enlist Drake to do it, you have to sort of put out of your mind your sense of the slave trade that we think about it, of Europeans going to capture people in Africa, enslave them. What Hawkins is doing is he is raiding Spanish ships and he's doing and justifying it by basically, he knows that these are people who the queen doesn't, like Queen Elizabeth I doesn't like. So Hawkins does get involved in the slave trade. He enlists Drake. Drake is involved in the slave trade, at least for some time. Drake eventually, over the course, this is as early as the 1560s. By the mid 1570s, Drake has emerged sort of on his own, if you will, uh, as a commander, as a military leader. He's involved in, but not the leader of, a notorious assault on an island called Raithland Island, uh, in which English soldiers massacre hundreds of, of people. This is an island between Northern Ireland and, and Scotland. Um, 1577, the English, an English explorer named Martin Frobisher decides he's going to look for the Northwest Passage, doesn't find it, comes back. It helps spur this new moment of exploration in England. And then Drake gets the commission from the Queen to have five ships to go through the Strait of Magellan uh, and he hopes around the world. It's a tough voyage through the Strait. He loses most of these ships. He has one ship. He rechristens it the Golden Hind. They sail north. Right? So this is the part which we're really talking about. What happens when Drake is sailing up the, the Pacific coast of the Americas? Uh, we know that he is raiding Spanish towns along the way. Again, part of the sort of imperial agenda that he has. And he sails beyond the reach of any Spanish settlements and he goes north. Scholars will debate. I imagine there are people on this, in this room who may be debating where exactly he went. This has been a subject of debate for a long time, and it's a subject of debate because the actual record is fairly thin. And so what historians and archaeologists try to do is piece together these various bits of evidence and try to figure out where he went. So some people think he might have made it as far as the Alaska coast. He seems to have made it up to Vancouver. Uh, there's an archaeologist named Melissa Darby who wrote a terrific book a couple of years ago called Thunder Goes North, who's convinced that the bay he lands in is in Oregon. But the majority of people so far who've looked at this conclude that Drake made it to Marin. Uh, and that's where he had this moment uh, in which he claims in this narrative uh, that he meets people who, if he is in Marin, coastal Miwoks in all likelihood, he meets these people and communicating through sign language. He believes that they say that they accept the queen as their monarch and that they're giving all of California, all of whatever to Drake. He then nails a picture of the queen on a post. That's fairly common. The fact that someone would do that to claim territory. He nails an English coin. Then he sails off, goes across the Pacific, makes it around and is hailed as a great hero when he makes it back to England. Um, that's in a nutshell, this, his most famous expedition. He does continue to be a famous explorer and Drake's defenders will point out that in the 1580s, he does go into the Atlantic, rest seems to liberate a number of enslaved people who the Spanish were holding, seems to have taken them up to Roanoke, to coastal Carolina and leave them there. The records are very thin about this, we don't know, but there are people who have said to the modern day, yes, Drake was involved in the slave trade early on and then later on did this, act. Now, is he doing it because he felt guilty about the slave trade? Is he doing it because he wanted to stick it to the Spanish again? We could debate that. But so I think that in a nutshell are probably the core issues. I probably forgot one of your questions, but I hope that was most of it. No, 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 that's great. And we can get back to those. I'm sure people will have comments about the, the what exactly Drake did, where he landed, and how he treated those he interacted with. Brian, I want to jump to you. When you moved to Marin, were you familiar with Sir Francis Drake. Um, I, I should point out that both of our guests today are graduates of Oberlin. They're, they're both very excited by this, <laughs> um, as well as numerous other excellent institutions. But um, were you familiar with Drake, Drake's legacy? Were you surprised to see his name everywhere in Marin? Did, were you connected at all to, um, in any way to his legacy here in, the, in Marin County? You know, like, uh, and it's great to be here with you, Beth and Peter, and thanks for the invitation. You know, I, I think, like Peter said, I think, you know, I, I knew that Drake was some person, 
some European that had sailed around the world and I had learned about him sometime between kindergarten and the end of high school. And, and that was pretty much, that was pretty much about it. And to be honest, I probably was confusing him with Magellan half the time. And then you get to Moran and his name is everywhere. Like, like Drake this and Drake that and Sir Francis to Drake, the mascot over at the Pacific. So I'm like, wow, he, Marin has laid claim to Drake. Um, and I was sort of shocked by it only because it didn't seem anywhere else in, in my travels anyone else had. Um, and one would have thought he had, he had done something momentous here. But again, it only seemed he had sort of been here. And that, that was really it. And I was like, okay, Sir Francis Drake is what gets you out to the shore. That, that was about my level of interaction. With, <laughs> Sir Francis with Sir Drake Francis. Boulevard. I should also add for those that don't know, the Pacifics is the very minor league baseball team that... It's not even a minor league team. It's like beneath the minors, right? Like anyway, that, that was my connection with Drake. Um, did you have, when you, you joined San Anselmo Town Council in 2017, when this was not an issue, when did kind of the, hey, wait a second, we might want to consider changing or removing Drake from these monuments, several of which directly impact your town. Um, when did that come up and, and how did you feel about it? How, what happened? Well, I mean, I think I, I think in 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 the Bay Area and, and in Marin in particular, there's always conversations about what's an appropriate name. But it was always it was always very light by your sort of you know by your your people who are really engaged with this kind of activity. And do you know about Sir Francis Drake? But it was never of, of to be honest of any significance or, or consequence. I mean, um, you know, it was it was the name of the the high school here in the Ross Valley, and it was just you know Drake everywhere. But then the high school decided to take down the name and they, they sort of, and I'm, I'm not privy to what their decision-making process was, but they just sort of took it down overnight. And it, it didn't seem that there'd been a whole lot of community conversation. Then all of a sudden it was sort of like, Drake is this integral part of our community and our reality and our shared history. How could this happen? And, you know, against this larger backdrop of cancel culture and, you know, every nation periodically is always reckoning with its past and the narratives of the past and how they inform the present. It all seemed wrapped up into our local high school, um, which then bled into we, the, you know, Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, the boulevard that so many traverse to get out from, uh, from Marin all the way out to the coast. What shall we do about that? If we, if we're addressing the name of the high school, should we not address the name of this boulevard where so many traverse and connect so many of our communities? And that's, that's when it really, you know, took on a level in, to be fair, a certain portion of the public's consciousness. I would always argue, not, not most, but certainly a certain portion. As a historian, Peter, are you, and I don't want to dive into the, I know in San Francisco, the renaming of schools and, and all over America, the renaming of monuments, of, of taking down certain monuments, particularly in the South, um, has been a, a hot topic. I want to stay on Drake. Um, were you surprised at the, the reckoning, I guess, in Marin County that came for Sir Francis Drake? Did you see this coming at all? Well, I would say that historians, we may be okay at interpreting the past, but we're not very good at predicting the future. So no, I didn't really give it time to think, is this coming? Though had I sat down to think about it, I would have thought, hmm, boy, he's kind of hung out as a, 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 a renowned figure for a long time and his day coming. But I think that a lot of our relationship with the past and about monuments the best and naming things the best changed in Charlottesville in 2017. Now I forget when the debate in San Anselmo began, but that put things you know, in a national consciousness in a way that they hadn't been before. Now on the East Coast and the South, they're reckoning with other things. So in California, I mean, what's so interesting to me about, um, about what, what the Drake debate is that you know, he, and I, I, I want Brian to really jump in on this because I, you know, I I'm not an expert on why he's canceled. But a lot of the public debate is about Drake's involvement in the slave trade. You know, I think it could be argued um, that you know the thing that the the that element of Drake's career, of course, needs to be explored. Right, we're in a moment, and and the 1619 Project Joseph you know, we're in a moment of rethinking the core relationship between enslavement and American history. Right, so I'm not saying don't do that about Drake. Strikes me though 
that one thing to focus on with Drake is what happens in California, which is not about enslavement per se, but it's about this Englishman who comes and he has these presumptions, you know, and these are, these are coming out of European ideas developed since the time of Columbus, you know, which Europeans think we have arrived in a place, there are no other Christian peoples here. We can claim this, we can own this, we can extract resources for it. We can add this to the territory held by our monarchs. That's where Drake is really useful. I mean, Drake is in many ways, you know, he is like many explorers, he's an opportunist. He wants to claim he's the first person to see things. He wants to put a mark up. That's why, I mean, I know there's this enormous debate in California. What, what were those plates that he left behind? Who knows? They haven't been found, but I will tell you, I do believe he likely nailed a, something to a post because I have records of other English explorers doing exactly the same thing. But he's doing that to say, I was here first. I represent the Queen of England. This is now English territory. This is something that really is, we not only reckon with the complexities of enslavement in the American past, I think those of us in California really need to reckon with the very complicated, tortured, painful, violent legacy of encounter between Europeans and indigenous peoples here on the West Coast. So yes, I think that putting Drake into that discussion not to say take him out of the enslavement discussion, but putting him in this discussion about the West Coast is very important. Brian, what, what, as these conversations began happening around removing Drake from either Sir Francis Drake, as it, as it relates, I guess, directly to San Anselmo, Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, which runs through unincorporated Marin County and then four other towns within Marin. Um, as well as Sir Francis Drake, what was formerly Sir Francis Drake High School, what is now Archie Williams High School. What fell into your and your colleagues' lap in terms of making decisions? Um, and how did, what was the process like? Because you've had to, you voted on this. Right, we, we did vote. And the process was, um, so it was, you, know, you laid it out very well. So the, the county, decides they're gonna convene a group of all the jurisdictions in the county to have a, a working group to discuss what, what, what are the possibilities. And that conversation is happening. Then at the same time, we're having our conversation in our community. And the conversation, as Peter rightly points out, really concerns a lot about the interaction between Sir Francis Drake and the Miwok community, the indigenous people that were here. So the, the Miwok community comes forward and says, hey, you know, we, we, we wanna be part of this conversation. And then you have, uh, then at the same time, you have everyone who had been engaged uh, at the school conversation, now participating in the town conversation. Because if you felt for whatever reason, the school conversation isn't going your way, or you felt you hadn't had any enough input, the town council is now your opportunity to weigh in. So we got so much information about Sir Francis, more information than I ever contemplated when I ran to serve the public on local government, right? Good budgeting, address flooding, uh, you know, safety, policing, fire, creating a new park. All of a sudden, we're getting all these sort of missives and about Sir Francis the Drake and being asked to evaluate them for their veracity and historical accuracy. None of which I'm qualified to do, right? That's Peter's job, right? He's a historian, like a, a sifting through these complex things. And so we're, we're, we're holding forums. Tensions are incredibly high. Um, language is vituperative. I think there's a, a lack of uh, empathy, sort of, uh, well, how can you know what the Miwok feel and how can you prove you're a Miwok? Something even as simple as, as crass as that, just mm. and a, a real lack of trying to find a, a common ground. Like, look, can we try and understand that none of us were there? I mean, really, like I, I couldn't begin to posit what was in Sir Francis Drake's mind. And I think Peter rightly points out, did he put something on, on, on the ground all that time ago? Who knows? But we do have a pretty good handle that European explorers were in the habit of claiming lands that they didn't know about, even if they didn't know where they were, <laughs> for the monarchs back then, right? And, and so there, there's, that, that sort of seems to be what it is. So ultimately, our community is, we're going to vote. And, uh, you know, and what do, the question is, what are we going to vote on? Do we vote to change the name? Do we vote to keep the Up name? The boulevard. Yeah, the boulevard, right? Because the high school is already on their process. So what are we going to- the high school is not your jurisdiction. The high school is its own- High school is its own thing, but we're part of that conversation. 
I'm getting communications from people in San Francisco angry over the renaming of those high schools. Like, how can this happen? This is why you can't let this happen here. I'm like, okay, you know, thank you for your input, but right. Oh, and of course the last piece is we're now in a Zoom world. And while we're always eager and happy for all kinds of public comment, we're getting public comment from literally everywhere. Hi, I am so-and-so and I, I care deeply about this issue. And as an elected official, you want to participate, you find the balance between the local constituents and obviously there's the worldwide backdrop, but it becomes a bit challenging on Zoom. So ultimately after public hearings and the weighing in and lots of emails, we, as my five members of council, have to decide like actually what to do. Because that's the actual business of local government, as I can see it, right? We, we show up and we make decisions. And so uh, two members offer, want, want a full name change. Two members. Full name from Sir Francis Drake Boulevard to? Unknown. Okay. Unknown. I know, right? Because that's that's another that's another community right conversation. Then. Like, what's what to name it? Because you know, ultimately, renaming things is incredibly problematic. I mean, people are really moving away from naming things after people. Archie Williams, notwithstanding, and right now and in somewhere, right? Like, that's that's problematic, um, right? It's unclear what will pass muster. Uh, then there's the uh, no name change, right? Like, let's just leave things are, and I. I sort of have been fairly consistent throughout this whole process, which is, look, you know, this is not really of great interest in the community, right? We're here in the pandemic. We have all kinds of challenges, right? Like, let alone, we're not really equipped to deal with this. Like, for instance, we never actually had someone of Peter's stature to come in and speak to us, to provide any sort of perspective on this, you know, at least in our council, like, right? Like just a, you know, a, a historian, someone who specializes in sifting through the, you know, the changing sands of history over time. I put forth, you know, look, can we, can we just opt with a dual name, right? Can we just simply leave it as Sir Francis Drake and honor the, the Miwok heritage, right? Can we, can we simply do that, come to some level of agreement and then move forward to other issues? But, How do you have a dual name? You know, I've seen this in other places I've traveled, right? So you sort of, you sort of leave Sir Francis Drake up and then you sort of figure out, and I wasn't like, how else to commemorate it? You sort of put, for, you could have put all on right underneath, you know, the Miwok Heritage Trail, right? Right, right, right alongside the sign. So people know as you're traversing this, you are also recognizing the Miwok legacy, you know, and, and that was my dual naming. I, I, you know, was not interested in trying to come to grips with the enslavement uh, narrative around Sir Francis Drake. I thought that was simply beyond us as a council. But ultimately, we we decided to do nothing. <laughs> we decided to do nothing as a council. Um, the county initiative kind of went nowhere. They couldn't come to agreement with their jurisdictions. And I believe the last I followed, Fairfax, a small town to the west of us, had said they will rename it, but nothing has come of that either. Like, I haven't seen any changing in the name. So it's I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say it's all sound and furious signifying nothing because I'd like to think hopefully these community conversations have led us to a better place to have this conversation and, and maybe we'll revisit this conversation in the future. Um, but for right now in, in San Anselmo, Sir Francis Drake High is now Archie Williams High. Um, it still stands, kids are still being educated. Uh, Sir Francis Drake Boulevard still will get you out and then uh, here we are. But when you're driving through Fairfax, theoretically, it might be something else. You, you're still going to be on the same road, but it might have a different name for the Fairfax part. In theory, right. Oh, and then the other thing, I guess, and uh, the last thing is there was a statue possibly of Sir Francis Drake. I believe it was Sir Francis Drake in Larkspur, which is another community is in San Francisco. Building. Yeah. Right. So that was also happening in, in our community because there was a whole thought of you know, with, with the statue was removed ostensibly for safety purposes. Well, you know, people were then feeling the loss of the statue. Then how is that affecting us in San Anselmo? It was quite the whirlwind. I was raised in Marin County and I always thought that was Don Quixote. I did so not. So did I actually. I drove past it. <laughs> I did not get that that statue with Sir Francis Drake. <laughs> I can see that. If you look at that statue. They have the same vibe. 
Um, all right, we're going to dive into some questions from our audience. And um, Peter, I'm going to start with you for some historical clarification, if, if you're willing. I'll try. Okay. Um, so let's, let's kind of did, I'm trying to phrase this. There's some, there's some strong Drake fans in the audience, and I'm trying to put this <laughs> gently. Um, after Drake came in, in, um, and theoretically put Queen Elizabeth's face on a wall somewhere and the coin and said, I now claim this land for Queen Elizabeth, despite I'm going to be really nice to you. I'm, uh, there's, there's lots of kind of, oh, he was, he got along with the coastal Miwok, assuming that this is where he landed again. Um, they crowned him. They gave him a beautiful crown. He communicated via made up sign language and he's convinced they're like, yeah, take all our land, give it to a queen we've never heard of. Um, he sticks her picture on a wall, leaves. Does he ever come back? Was he responsible for any kind of specific colonization of those people? Did his doing so lead to the future colonization of this area, which obviously as Brian and I sit here clearly was. Yeah, no, he does not go back. Uh, not, not, not back to the Pacific coast of you know, North America. He, as I say, he sails, he's in the Atlantic doing things, but he doesn't go back to Cal what's now California. He doesn't go back to Oregon, wherever you want to argue that he landed. Uh, he doesn't come back. Um, here's where you know, things get a little, you know, the record is fairly thin. I think, I mean, as I start out to say, the record is fairly thin. What we have, if you, if you skip ahead to it after he's deceased, there are people promoting the English colonization of North America who mark this is where Drake went uh, all along California, right? And there are charters, that is uh, agreements for English colonists to take land that extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It's called sea to sea clauses in these charters that I think are probably related to the fact that the English thought they already claimed the Pacific coast because of Francis Drake. But the English in fact don't colonize the Pacific coast. The Spanish, after Cabrillo had sailed up and down in 1542, the Spanish are not active really along the Spanish coast in terms of colonization, Atlantic Pacific coast colonization until Sarah, a whole nother controversy, which we're not going to get into today, like what happens Father, there, another thing Sarah, that Californians yes. have reckoned with and continue to reckon with, right? But so no, for a long time, no, the English do not have extensive interest, but they, I think they certainly believe this is their territory. And I think in, throughout the 17th into the 18th century, the idea that this is their land does figure in how they conceptualize the conquest and colonization of North America. Uh, but that's after Drake himself has departed the scene. Um, we have a question here from, let me scroll back up. Um, how do we know, what was the, the present day, Brian, I guess this is for you, the present day Miwok community's involvement in these discussions? They were, they were definitely members of the, of the Miwok community involved in it and and they and they and they spoke, and you know ultimately what weight uh, the council members chose to give those members um, was of individual choice. I will have to say, I from my perspective, I didn't think there were that many members of the Miwok community um, that came and spoke. At least before San and Sumo, there's probably a number of, of reasons for that. I mean, I know uh, from my counterparts uh, in Fairfax, you know, some of the some of the commentary directed toward. The individuals of, of Mimak descent was just uh, was unseemly and awful, to be honest. And and just you know, and I can see why people would not want to participate in a public forum to subject them themselves to that. That didn't happen in San Anselmo, um, I think, in large part because we were aware of the experiences that they had had in Fairfax, and so we kept a tight rein on the public uh, discussion. That surprises me. I guess it shouldn't, but it surprises me that in this day and age, particularly around, um, as as we say, cancel culture and the the uh, reimagining, the rethinking of how we recognize American history and the way we name name our streets, our monuments, our high schools, um, that people would continue to be so vitriolic in their engagement their civic engagement were you surprised by that no no i mean no i mean public discourse is you know public service is not for the thin skins and public discourse has uh only gotten coarser uh during the pandemic 
So I was, I was uh, unfortunately not, not surprised, but the attacks were just deeply personal and, you know, sort of talking about Miwok culture. And I, I, had a, I had a hard time believing that these people had any depth, in-depth understanding of Miwok culture, let alone to make negative, you know, comments about it. So it was disappointing. Brian, you are the first Black person ever elected in Marin County to a city or town council. Um, that in and of itself is, is a, you know, a, a pioneering move and congratulations. And I hope that there are many, many more. Um, it must have been odd to have this question of the slave trade and how it and that involvement in Marin County um, come up during your tenure as a council person. Um, how did how did that feel and how did you navigate that? Well, you know, it's certainly, again, it's nothing when I ran for office, I didn't say, by the way, I'm, I'm going to run because I want to be a council member and I'm going to address the slave trade uh, as Sir Francis Drake, right? Like, there's not, that, was, that was not my tagline. Um, right. And I, I have to say, I do feel, at least in some quarters, there's, uh, there's a part of, well, Brian, we know you're going to see this through the prism of, you know, being African-American and you know whatever your personal feelings might be about slavery and while that certainly filters through with everything i mean you know i think i think peter uh laid it out so well you know drake's engagement here in california really is based around the miwoks and i'm in no position at all you know that i i we got so many emails drake was a slaver but then he released his slave and then he went back and he freed his slaves and you know I never really spent any time trying to discern whether or not that was that was true. I, I couldn't really understand what the relevance was, frankly, for a policy discussion to rename a road, um, particularly since I, I thought there was a way to sort of at least uh, address it with a dual naming thing and move forward. I mean, ultimately, you know, historical figures, um, they, they, are sort of, they sort of are what they are. Right. I mean, you, you sort of look and they say, well, they're, they're imperfect. Right. And certainly slavery is a, a heinous thing, but there's been a lot of heinous things, frankly, done to a, a lot of people of all genders, sexualities, orientations forever. So ultimately, you have to sort of come to grips with that or nothing will be named. Right. Ultimately, well, everything will be named blank or it, it's just very challenging. It was it was difficult for me to navigate it um, only because I think some of the unfair expectations that people were sort of placing their own oh he's african-american so i know he's going to be looking at it this way as opposed to well let me see what kind of thoughtful person brian is and understand where he's coming from he might even want to hear what i have to think before making up his mind so in in terms of i guess historical figures um and peter this this could be a question well for both of you and I guess to play devil's advocate to the humans are flawed, you can't judge a 15th, 16th century person on 21st century morals, um, ethics, or uh, are there some his, historical figures whose actions are so horrible that we, as we rethink them now, go, well, actually, Drake was, you know, he did involve himself in the slave trade we children are attending a school named after this guy that stole land claimed land um this land from indigenous people people of color for english people for the queen of england um and i'm not i'm, I'm not advocating either way for that but i know that you know in san francisco it, it all over the place has dealt with this um do you think peter Drake's actions were dangerous enough, harmful enough to warrant name removal? Well, that's a really complicated question. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I the mean, whole thing is complicated. Yeah, the whole thing, the whole thing is complicated. I mean, part of, I mean, part of what's going on with Drake uh, and the debate over Drake, it's not only, you know, was Drake involved in enslavement of the slave trade, but part of it is, um, is the way that Drake was understood by, by previous generations of Californians. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that you can find online about this, but there's a wonderful chapter on this. It's a great Stanford historian named Richard White who has a book a couple years ago called California Exposures. And as Richard points out in that, in that book, a lot of the obsession for Drake 
uh, in the 19th century was because a lot of white Californians wanted uh, to celebrate the fact that uh, the first Europeans who were there were Protestant as opposed to Catholic, right? I mean, this plays into a whole nother level of debate, which we're not getting into. And then Drake becomes sort of this hero to these people who at the end of the 19th and early 20th century, you know, are sort of, you know, want to promote what they would have called sort of, you know, Anglo-Saxon past, right? Again, which, which plays it again with modern debates, right? But Drake's not making any claim like that, right? I mean, that's a, that's a, that is a put on Drake hundreds of years after Drake is gone. So is the question, do you hold Drake responsible for what people thought Drake did hundred years later? That seems a bit unfair to, to Drake. You know, should his name be on a school? You know, I, 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 as, as I say in the, in the article, I think, you know, we, you know, to use this phrase we use, I think thinking with Drake is really important. It, Drake really reveals a lot about the complicated history of California's past and a lot about this era that we used to call the age of discovery, which we might as well call an era of conquest and colonization. There's a lot there that you could unpack. And I am without trying to dodge the question, which I am now completely going to do. That's what I you know, it's, it's for me, I mean, Brian, I'm ready to take the invitation and come up and talk to the council anytime. I love Marin, just I'll come on up. But it's not for me as a historian to basically say, should people now take the name off of right. school? I mean, I, I would probably have not supported putting his name on the school, but you know, that's my, I don't live there. Brian has so well uh, established the, the, the context here and the complicated and tense relations that have happened in the past between indigenous people in the region and others who've come into the area. Um, and I, I, I'm not, again, it sounds like I'm dodging the question. Oh, I'm just gonna dodge the question. Okay. Sorry, I apologize for that, but that's my, my sort of take. I, I do think it's, I think what we need to do as historians is try to push away as much as we can some of these later glosses on individuals try to get back to what the documents tell us. In this case, the documents are, are fairly fragmentary, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and imperfect, period. No matter what people argue, that just is the case. So then we, historians always interpret things as we see the world. But in this case, we have to pour through these layers to get at Drake. And I think that's a, 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 an exercise we're doing. That doesn't mean we put his name on something. It doesn't necessarily mean we take his name off something. So that's my sort of, Brian, is the town of San Anselmo done with the Drake discussion? Oh, I mean, history is always being written and rewritten. I mean, some, right, like some people might simply say, oh, the timing wasn't right. And, you know, in, in 80 years, perhaps the community will have changed. I mean, geez, you're celebrating some guy who may or may not have been here 500 years ago. I find it hard to believe in 500 years, this road is still gonna be called the same thing. I mean, is there still gonna be a road, right? We might all be using around jet packs, right? <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> right, right? It might all be green, right? So, it, it, so it's hard to be really, you know, like, oh, it'll have to be Sir Francis Drake forever. So the community clearly had a particular, at least those really energized around this. Um, but I, I suspect, not tomorrow, but sometime between now and not so far in the future, this conversation will come up again. What's the what's the hot issue in San Anselmo right now, if not renaming Drake Boulevard? <laughs> what's the big controversy? The what's big the controversy. Scandal? The big controversy in San Anselmo is parklets. Okay. Whether or not San Anselmo should remove should should continue to remove 12 parking spaces to continue to encourage outdoor dining. Is that, that, that's, that's it. That, I think we've had three or four community forums on this. Is that the kind of small town problem solving that you wanted to kind of get involved with in the first place? You know, uh, here's the, you know, on a certain level, yes, because I actually, what, what surprises me is I just never thought it would take so long I didn't know you could talk, you could talk about, you know, parklets. By the time we're done with parklets, people will be jetpacking all over, right? And they'll be droning in their food. You're really <laughs> going to like our upcoming space issue, by the way. I'm going to send you a copy of that. You're oh, then jet pack. I will definitely be excited about <laughs> it. Um, but the, it's interesting, you know, uh, to get involved in small town, San Anselmo, how many, what's the population of San Anselmo? Like 13,000 and a half. All right, so, so let's, let's say a small town. To get involved um, 
in a relatively small town in a community like Marin County and to see your sit your town kind of put on the national stage in terms of the strike thing it's as you mentioned not why you got involved um is why did you what what inspired you to do this in the first place you didn't grow up in Marin um I did not grow up in Marin I used to visit Marin in the 80s a buddy of mine uh grew up here and uh, my wife and I like so many others in San Francisco moved out here for the weather the schools the open space all that kind of stuff and what really encouraged me to get engaged was there were so few of my peers, um, which, in, uh, you know, parents with young kids, they were just not engaged in the political process. They just didn't know how it worked or what was going on. And I got really involved to help revitalize uh, downtown. Um, and they were like, oh, you, you, you're engaged. And I'm like, no, I'm not like, you know, an answer. You, you know what's going on. And that's what, you know, I thought, hey, I could, you know, work with the community and pull like-minded people together and, and make a difference. That's what encouraged me. Um, well, it's an amazing journey. I'm so grateful to both of you for being here and educating us about Sir Francis Drake's past and his presence, at least in the Marin County area. Um, for those of you who are watching and tuning in, um, don't worry if you missed any part of this conversation or want to revisit it or want to ask more questions, you can absolutely do so. It's been recorded and will be posted to altaonline.com later today. If you've got any comments on this, we're going to send you a link to Peter's article um, as well as, as anything else that came up. We'll go through our archives and see if there's anything else that we want to send you. Um, as well as you can visit Brian's website and the um, sananselmo.gov or whatever it is. He's doing great work in San Anselmo. <laughs> um, so we'll send you that later today in an email. Also visit altaonline.com for more details. Please join us next week here at Alta Live um, for a conversation with four poets, authors, artists, and activists, all from Fresno to discuss the vibrant culture that is emerging from the community in and around Fresno. That's Wednesday, June 8th, yes, <laughs> I'm here at 12.30. Again, I am so grateful to our guests today, Brian Colbert, Peter C. Mancall. Thank you both for joining us. It's been really enlightening. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next week.